I see this process as nothing less than a struggle for the soul of humanity. It begins with a shift in worldview, answering the question, who are we really? What is human nature? Are we humans what the elite would have us believe? Stupid, greedy creatures who, if left to our own devices, would devolve into violence and chaos, and so for our own good must be ruled over by a self-appointed elite? Or are we naturally caring and creative? I believe when people are healthy and have what we need to survive, we can create a world based on integrity, freedom, and compassion. A world where everyone can thrive. Which of these two views will shape our future? That's our choice now. The agenda of the ruling elite is the product of a destructive worldview, based on their beliefs that there's not enough to go around, that some people are more deserving than others, and that their own safety depends on maintaining absolute control over the rest of us. In short, their worldview is based on scarcity and fear. But as powerful as they are, the architects of the New World Order cannot create their dreadful vision without our collusion. To stop them, to render their agenda obsolete, we have to wake up. We have to take action. This is like the, the last effort of a particular phase of civilization. It's its last gasp, really, and I often use the metaphor of the caterpillar becoming the butterfly, because the caterpillar crunches its way through the ecosystem, it's very destructive, it eats 300 times its weight in a day, until it's so bloated that it hangs itself up and goes to sleep, and its skin turns into a hardened chrysalis, and then in its body you get these imaginal cells, biologists actually call them that, forming within the caterpillar's body. The caterpillar's body then actually becomes a nutritive soup for those cells. But what's important about that metaphor is that the old and the new coexist for a while. And it's the job of the caterpillar to preserve its life. It's a desperate government that we have now trying to control oil in the Middle East and wanting now to promote nuclear energy and all these things that they know better, but they have to play out the role of protecting themselves. It's their job. And if you love butterflies, you don't go around stepping on caterpillars. So we can't hate them. It doesn't do any good. But if you want alternative energy, you don't ask an oil economy uh, administration to produce it for you. We have to produce it. We imaginal cells have to show that it's cheaper, more efficient, and, and more effective. Our job is to build a new world. If we had the vision and a worldview that says our crisis is a birth and everybody's needed and everybody will have more of what they truly want, you could turn this desperate world into a renaissance of human creativity and love. It may seem that the controlling elite has all the cards, but we have many advantages of our own. First, let's talk numbers. Very few people are consciously perpetrating the domination agenda. Most of those helping to implement the plan don't understand the full picture of what they're a part of. By my calculations, we outnumber the actual architects of the plan by more than a million to one in the US alone. Entrepreneur and environmentalist Paul Hawken estimates that there are now well over one million organizations in the world that work towards social and environmental justice, comprising the largest social movement in the history of humankind. This movement, when connected electronically, could become a network of networks that will be the most powerful activist force for change ever. If you look at the people who are involved with restoring this earth and stopping the damage and resisting the depredation and nurturing change and reimagining what it means to be a human being. And you're not optimistic, then you, you might want to get your heart checked, you know, because there is an extraordinary, beautiful, gorgeous, fierce group of people in this world who are taking this on 
The second important advantage for us is that all the power centers that the elite control require our participation. If enough of us withdraw our support, their plan can't work. This is true of the central banks, the military, the corporate media, the government, and more. And following the models of Mahatma Gandhi and Martin Luther King Jr., we have the power of nonviolent non-participation. It takes tremendous energy, resources, and deception to try to dominate the lives of others. In moving toward freedom, on the other hand, we have on our side the evolutionary life force and what Gandhi called Satyagraha, the simple power of truth. In India, we have thousands of villages which are now freedom zones. So we will not accept patenting. We will not cooperate with it, just like Gandhi did not cooperate with salt laws. We will not allow chemicals and genetically engineered crops to enter our ecosystems because they threaten this biodiversity. And this freedom movement, which is a freedom movement for all species, not just for individual humans, is something that's growing so fast and is reflected in the movement for GMO-free zones in Europe. I turn my back and there's another thousand GMO-free zones. 90% of Italy, 90% of Austria. The freedom zones uh, around the seed, around um, food, are, are creating massive shifts. In Bolivia, a grassroots movement took to the streets relentlessly banging pots and pans and eventually stopped the foreign corporate takeover of their water resources. Though very little is shown by the corporate media, there are countless success stories going on every day all over the world. I wasn't willing to make this film until I knew there were responses that are a match for the crisis. And now the power of the internet enables us to share the breadth and the depth of this research. We've spent years creating a vast website, thrivemovement.com, that brings it all together and makes the information and what we can do about it accessible to everyone. Here you have your very own navigator module to go deeper into the main subjects covered in the film code, problem, and solutions. You can study strategies and tactics and connect with others to take high leverage actions. Every fact stated in this film has been independently verified and the reference is on our website. This sector navigator facilitates whole systems thinking that recognizes that actions in one area impact all the others. The center of the sector navigator is worldview because it determines how we experience everything that happens within and around us. In every sector, you'll find critical issues, resources, group strategies, and individual actions to peacefully and productively affect real change. Our resource tree will link you to the people, organizations, and media that we most recommend to help you get more fully educated and engaged. I was encouraged to find that there are a minimum number of actions which, working together, can tip the scales. It's not endless. Once we see the big picture, we'll look at what each of us can do to help accomplish it. Let's take a look at the strategic antidotes to their economic domination. We need to stop any more bailouts of banks or corporations, dismantle the Federal Reserve, Withdraw taxpayer support from central banking agencies such as the IMF and World Bank. Allow development of alternative currencies and independent banks and refuse international taxes. My main emphasis is on solutions in the US because that's what I know best. But just as the predicament is global, so are the principles on which the solution strategies are based. Here are some tactical actions that we can take as individuals that don't take much time or money to make a real difference right now. Get informed.
speak up and connect with others. Bank locally. When we move our money out of the big centralized banks and into locally owned banks and credit unions, we defund the problem and fund the solution all in one move. Buy and invest responsibly. Every dollar you spend sends a message. Join the movement to audit and end the Federal Reserve. It's robbing us. Join a coalition to keep the internet fair and open. Don't let anybody take control over it. Support independent media. Get your information from diverse sources and think about who's funding the news you get. Support organic, non-GMO farming. Join movements to bring about honest elections, including traceable paper ballots and campaign finance reform. Congress can only be accountable to us when corporations stop funding them. Advocate for renewable and new energy technology. Bring the conversation about free energy out into the open. It will transform the power dynamic on this planet faster than anything in recorded history. Sign up for critical mass actions. It's a strategy to leverage our power by waiting until a huge number of us agree to participate before taking an action. Imagine a million of us acting in unison. Then again, imagine even more. I've been inspired by how many grounded solutions and real life problem solvers there actually are. Akila Sharils is one person whose work especially touched me. He helped broker a gang truce between the Crips and Bloods. One of the things that we discovered in the process of, uh, of waging peace in the neighborhood was that conflict is healthy. You know, it's actual, it's unresolved conflict that actually leads to violence. When we first launched the peace treaty, we've had, we had a lot of success in our first year. Gang homicides dropped 44% in the neighborhood based upon our actions. Akila describes what happened when two rival gang leaders finally met after the truce. The brother came up to him and told him, man, look, I know you got some hard feelings for me. You know, maybe I got some hard feelings for you. He said, but because of this truce, man, he said, I'm willing to put all of that to the side. And, um, and he stuck out his hand. He hugged him and he said he closed his eyes because he was preparing for, a, you know, a sharp, you know, a knife to enter his back. He was waiting for the, you know, for a bullet you know, to be shot into his stomach. But he said after a few moments, you know, he held that, 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 that embrace. You know, he, he realized that, um, you know, that it was genuine. I believe that having a clear picture of our potential is as important as uncovering what stands in its way. So I want to take you to a possible world of the future. It's a world the elite would have you believe is an impossible pipe dream but I'm convinced it's a world that is utterly within our grasp. We can create a world where people can thrive, where we can feel safe and secure. The air, water, and food are clean. A world where communities are capable of producing their own energy and food, and trade is open and fair. Rather than focusing on punishment, Instead, justice restores lives and losses. Insurance pays doctors to keep people healthy. Education is voluntary, serving the needs of individuals instead of corporations. We get honest feedback from independent media. There are no subsidies and no bailouts. Imagine that with an honest money system, little or no taxes, and low electric and fuel bills, you would have the money to pay off your home and car and be free to save and invest. You would enjoy more wealth, freedom, and security, all while working the same or probably less. Let's say I started a mutual fund for my neighborhood and all the neighbors had stock, okay? And, and so they healed the environment and their stock went up in value. So instead of getting drained financially, they're making money. They're making money from things that make their kids safer and, and prevent the planet from dying. 
So you kind of have your cake and eat it too. Instead of working all week to make money and then coming home and trying to save the planet on the weekends, you can spend Monday through Friday making money saving the planet and then, you know, go to the beach. <laughs> This vision of a thriving world is based on what could be called the liberty perspective. There is a simple principle that underlies this approach, non-violation. Nobody gets to violate you or your property, and you don't get to violate anyone else, except in genuine self-defense. This is the one rule I've found that every single person agrees with, at least for themselves. I believe that non-violation is the true north of humanity's moral compass and our core navigating insight. This insight can guide us and protect each and every individual as we set up voluntary, self-sustaining systems. It is a way of living that I can stand for wholeheartedly and without reservation. I've been profoundly influenced by the work of Austrian economist Ludwig von Mises, who developed a whole philosophy and economic system based on the core ethic of non-aggression. Motivated by having witnessed the ravages of communism and fascism in Europe, he committed his life to finding a just way. He recognized that those systems, as well as socialism and even democracy, wrongly assume the rights of the collective or the group to be more important than those of the individual. I had always gone along with the view that more people will thrive if we consider the group's needs above the individual's. But when I took a closer look, I found it doesn't really work that way. In the name of what's best for the group, governments have been responsible for most of the war, death, and destruction on the planet. More than 200 million individuals were killed in the 20th century alone. So how would applying the principle of non-violation change this dynamic? It would take us from incremental change of a fundamentally flawed system to a complete transformation where not just some or even the majority, but everyone could truly have the opportunity to thrive. In order to implement the principle of non-violation, it makes sense to me to honestly re-examine our past because it doesn't work to try to build a healthy living system on top of an unhealthy one. We have to go back to the most fundamental acts of injustice upon which the country was founded in the seizure of the lands of the people and the slaughter of their women and children uh, in, the, in the, uh, the rendering destitute most of the remnants of these people is such a, an a grievous wrong, uh, that we believe that we have to deal with that, to come to grips with that in a fundamental way. Understanding that they're not wrongs that were done and completed uh, 150 years ago. They're wrongs that are continued every single day. So you have, you know, through the history of North America and the United States, over 500 treaties signed with indigenous nations, where every single one of them now has been violated. You have, in fact, a tremendous amount of wealth having been generated from indigenous people's lands and resources and billions of dollars every year still being generated by corporations and European nations based on the continued exploitation of indigenous people's lands and resources. If we didn't have large corporations, if we didn't have Western governments defining how you and I were to relate to each other, living here in North America now together, how would we relate to one another? How would we make it different? It's going to take time and courageous effort to shift the consciousness and accomplish the tasks that will move us toward the world I'm talking about. And yet I know of no greater gift that we could give to future generations. We can't do everything at once. I envision three overlapping stages of the solutions process. In stage one, we bring as much integrity as possible to our current systems. If we cut the U.S. military budget in half, it would still roughly equal the defense spending of the entire rest of the world. Between that and getting rid of the Federal Reserve, over a trillion dollars a year would be freed, enough to feed everyone on our planet, deal with social issues, and heal our environment. Many people believe that widespread starvation and poverty are inevitable, but compared to war, eliminating poverty and restoring the environment are cheap. 
According to Lester Brown's Earth Policy Institute, it would take under $200 billion a year to restore the Earth's environment and meet global social goals. But this stage isn't the end goal of the Liberty Perspective. While stage one has a lot of the compassion typically associated with a liberal Democrat agenda, stage two reflects much of the wisdom of the traditional conservative worldview. In stage two, we shrink government's role to protecting individual liberty and stewarding things we share in common, like ecosystems and the airwaves we use to communicate. As the system gains integrity and we move to sound currency, people will have enough money to have more control over everything that affects them. Stage three grows out of the increasing freedom that people gain in stages one and two as they have more money and more time. There is no involuntary tax and therefore no involuntary governance. There's no monopoly on force. There are rules, but no rulers. Rigorously protecting individual rights turns out to be key for honoring our interdependence. We can be distinct and unified at the same time. As utopian as this can sound at first, I've been thrilled to see how much practical thinking has been done to deal with tough issues like health care, crime, and education. These three stages validate the best of both the liberal and conservative perspectives that have divided us for so long, and then reconcile them at a new level around non-violation, a core ethic we all share. Stage three honors human incentive and finally includes the rights of not just many, not just most, but everyone. The Taurus provides a template for a society based on integrity and wholeness. It conserves what's working. It has built-in feedback so it can self-correct and innovate to maintain balance. We can apply these and other features of the Taurus dynamic to our human social systems. I truly believe that aligning consciously with the fundamental life energy pattern at every level, physical, emotional, mental, interpersonal, and environmental, is ultimately the art, the science, and the celebration of love. And that's what we're here to learn. The fundamental insight of our interconnectedness changed the way I approach everything. In my own life, I found a practical expression of this philosophy in the modern nonviolent martial art of Aikido. It offers powerful guidance on how to respond effectively and non-aggressively to the global domination agenda. Morihei Uyeshiba, its founder, taught that to practice Aikido, one must mimic the movements of atoms and galaxies. Just as free energy technology blends with the toroidal pattern to access unlimited power, Aikido, the way of harmony, blends with the energy of an attacker. Redirecting it to peaceful resolution. Gandhi and King applied these principles of non aggressive power at the economic and social levels. If we respond with violence to the domination agenda, other than in self-defense, it would only continue the old us versus them paradigm and provide an excuse for even more police state measures. I believe that it's essential, both morally and strategically, that we take the path of non-aggression. There is another aspect of the Taurus that has profound implications for how we can respond to the challenges before us. It is the absolute stillness, the zero point, that lies at the center of each toroidal system. I believe that you and I, as well as every other being, are Taurus energy fields, centered by stillness and each connected to one another and to the boundless consciousness of a living universe. As much as I benefit from the experience of others, as highlighted here with the Navigating Insights, 
And as valuable as daily feedback is about what's really going on in the world, as we see with the vitals, I've come to recognize that our primary compass is our own inner guidance. As we learn to quiet the noise and amplify the inner signal, we can better hear the voice that naturally knows and offers wise direction. We have a, an entire inner life, a vibrant and lively inner life that is truly the navigator of the path that we take on the outside. If your inner life is the driver of how you show up in the world, it makes sense that if you want to have anything to do with where you're going, that you have to be in relationship to that inner life. You have to be in relationship to the driver. As we develop increased relationship to who's in the driver's seat, what happens is the, there is a synergy. It's a symbiotic relationship that our inner lives are actually able to be more in tandem with where we're choosing to go and we're able to get there. We're not nearly as insignificant in our impact as we think we are. In order to heal the world, we have to start telling a different story to ourselves. We have to start engaging in a different story with others. It's our collective story that manifests as the world. Humanity is now in a very interesting evolutionary phase in which we move from hostile, aggressive competition, which is the nature of young species, into a more mature mode of cooperation, collaboration. There's no question in this country that m money, that capital, is being increasingly concentrated in the hands of a few. And uh, those who are so powerful are concentrating it further. But there is a force that's more powerful, and that's the power of the people. When we look at the crises now, it is so easy to fall out of love with life. It is so easy to get pessimistic and desperate. But from my perspective, the crisis has matured to the point of being on the threshold of mass awakening. And that, that feeling inside me gives me the vitality to know that you no know, matter how small what I'm doing looks to me in the face of these huge problems, that the impulse of evolution is not small. And when it's in everybody who's waking up, it's huge. And as more and more of us are waking up, linking up, and daring to speak up, the scheme for global domination is being exposed. And we're discovering solutions that can create the world we yearn for and deserve. Again and again throughout history, when people have recognized tyranny rearing its cruel head, they've come together and stood up for liberty. I am confident humankind will look back on this period and be proud that when we saw, we acted. Thank you for coming on this journey with us. I'm convinced we have what it takes to thrive. Let's make it happen. Does a 
take to thrive while we've been sleeping our hearts were beating so much closer than you ever knew beneath the noise there is an inner voice whispering clear and true the veils are finally lifted takes to thrive and come together while the waters rise there's a stirring deep inside deep inside to come together to stand up for our life we all have what it takes to thrive and come together while the waters rise there's a stirring takes to thrive.